We'll show some basic tips on customizing and organizing your Macintosh computer. Uh, we're going to demonstrate it on this machine I'm in front of right now, which is a pretty brand new MacBook Pro, and it's running OS 11.6 Big Sur, if that's of interest to you. And so now I am going to go and figure out how to minimize. So uh, I purposely put a bunch of things on the desktop because one of the things that have come up has come up uh, multiple times is how to create folders, how to organize and, and tame things. So that's one of the things that we'll do. Um, the first thing I think I'm going to do is go to, um, I'm gonna go up here and I'm gonna go to the finder. And we're gonna go back to this uh, again and again. And I'm gonna go to the Apple menu where it says system preferences. I'm going to click on that. And then I'm going to look around for accessibility. Give me a second, uh, right here. And this is something that you might find uh, handy. So I'm now in the uh, system preferences and we'll go back to that again and again. But one of the first things I'm going to display and cursor. And the cursor is this, the little pointer that you see. And can you see the size of it now? It's you know generally okay, but um, as our eyes age or whatever, you may want to have a slightly larger cursor and find it. So I'm going to just drag the slider along. And you can see as I'm dragging the slider, it's also the cursor, the arrow is getting larger. So I'm gonna go for about here because I figured that would make it easier for you to see it as we go along. And another trick on a Mac, which I just found out um, by doing research for this, is if you can't find your cursor, it's, you know, you know, sometimes it's just hidden somewhere or whatever. If you give it a good shake, it actually gets larger. Do you see that? So as you shake it, it gets larger and you'll be able to see it. So, you know, that's a, a little tip. Okay. So I am going to right now organize the desktop. Um, so I have a mouse. Uh, right here attached to uh, this. It has a, um, uh, a touchpad on it and a keyboard, but I, for this, thought it'd be easier to put an external keyboard on it. And I am going to right click. And this is something that you might find pretty handy. There's a few ways to sort and organize your stuff. So you see how everything is kind of um, all over the place. I use the right click button on the mouse you could also do control click by holding down the control key and clicking if you have um, um, with the keypad or um, with a, um, a mouse that doesn't have like the two buttons on it. And we're also gonna go into the mouse a little bit more in, in a minute. So I'm gonna right click and it gives me all these choices. And one of which is sort by. So you have the option to sort things through different criteria. Um, I think the most, um, popular one is usually by name, so you can find things alphabetically. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do sort by name. And everything kind of magically just kind of got into order. Now, when you do the sort, it actually kind of locks it in place. So if I were to grab this folder that says taxes and just want to move it, it's not going to allow me to change the order because it's keeping it in firm alphabetical order. Um, so now I'm going to right click again and go to sort by, and there's an option for none. And when I do that, it's gonna go back to the kind of higgledy-piggledy, helter-skelter way it was before. Uh, so this is the one that I use more often. I'm going to right click and do clean up by. And when you do clean up, it'll sort it. Well, let's see, I'm gonna do by name. It'll sort it, but it'll allow you to make some changes like say, oh, I wanna make sure the taxes folder is right over here or I want to move this screenshot over here. So, um, um, so I hope that's a, um, a hope, hope that's a helpful tip. Okay. Now, um, so there are two, um, so, okay, about organization. And I'm also gonna show you how to create a folder. So I'm going to right click once again, or if you needed to, you could um, control, hold the control key down and click with the mouse or the keypad to get this menu. And I'm going to go new folder. And when you do that, um, if, if you don't touch the mouse or do anything, it'll be blue, as you can see. And you can just type right in there without having to um, you know, click on it again. So I'm going to call this one uh, cleanup. Okay. And then I'm going to, and you can see it's still active. Like the, 
the, um, the it's still flashing the insertion point over there. So I'm going to click, and now it's uh, kind of locked in. Um, if you ever want to change the name of a folder again, like I say, well, cleanup was too vague. I'm just going to click on it once, and then I'm click on a pause, and click on it again, and then it's active, and I can make it clean up. I don't know now to motivate myself. So there we go. Now, once you have, say, this folder, and I say I want to do cleanup, I can just drag things into it. And I'm going to drag this one, which is from one of our classes, the password log. And I'm just going to and take it and pop it over there. And recipes. I'm going to put recipes into cleanup now. I'm going to put the pointer, the cursor right on it. I'm going to click down with my finger. And keeping my finger down, I'm just going to drag and let it go. And I guess I lingered too long and then it just opened up the folder. Now, if you have tons of things on your desktop and you just want to put them all into one, you can lasso them. So I am putting the pointer over here. I'm going to click down just like I did before, but now I'm going to drag it across. And hopefully you can see how I am grabbing a bunch of things. Now you want to make sure you don't grab something you know, unintended. But for here, I think all those things can go into the cleanup now folder. So, and notice when I let go, everything is kind of highlighted. So I can just go over and click and drag one and they all will come over. And I'm gonna drop it down. I am also going to grab all these, drag them over, drop them in. And then I'm gonna grab this last one from a class we did uh, two years ago, a cat videos class, which was fabulous. And I'm just gonna drag, drag it in there. So now you notice how uh, messy the desktop was before, now it is tamed. But of course, all those things are still uh, inside this folder. And uh, yeah, so, I mean, you deal with it. Can you go over like how to like right click? Y yes. Um, and I'm also gonna go, we're also gonna customize the mouse and the, um, uh, touchpad settings when we get into the control panels. But um, so if you have a mouse like this, hope I can see it. So this is a standard kind of PC mouse, which has two buttons. And when you plug it into your Mac, you know, a mouse like this, it'll automatically know that you can right click. And then um, depending on the, the uh, you know, your dexterity and uh, your biomechanics, generally you would put your hand over it kind of like this and move it around. And this one is the single click, and I guess um, and I'm going to do that now. Doesn't see, um, and then if I use this finger up here, I can do the right click, and that brings up the special menu. Um, if you have one of the kind of sleek, cool Apple mice that are um, like almost a touchpad themselves, um, you have to go into the control panel to tell it to uh, enable the right side to click, and we'll go over that. Um, now, if you're using the touchpad, which so on the base of, and I can't show it to you because it's part of the computer. If I had a mirror, maybe I could do it. Um, but there is the touchpad, and I'm just moving my, with a single finger, I'm just moving it around. And that's good for navigation, and I can go somewhere. Now, if I want to do the double click, and this is a, they call them gestures. And so if you put your two fingers together and you click at the same time, then you get, it's the same as a right click, and you get that special menu. So it'll just take a little practice and then it'll be like second nature to you in doing it. So once again, two fingers together. Uh, so I'm bringing them down onto the touchpad. And I wonder if I can, can it show it? I guess I can show it a bit. Here are my fingers. And if I'm over here, if I'm over here, and if I put two fingers down, then you get the special menu. Um, okay. I hope that uh, um, that is clear. Um, and, uh, and once again, in this case, I have attached this, um, an external keyboard and a mouse just to make it easier for me to do this. But I can also be doing this on the keyboard um, right here that's part of the MacBook Pro. So now we're going to go to the Apple menu or the uh, Apple icon. And I'm going to go into About This Mac. And this can be super handy because you might want to know, well, what version of the Mac do, um, do I have? Um, and in here, it shows you right now. It's showing us what version of the operating system. It usually has a number. 
um, and then um, some kind of a cool name. So in this case, it's version 11.6 Big Sur. So that is the current uh, operating system, the current version. Um, it'll also tell you what kind of chip. This is one of the newer Macs, so it has the new chip that Apple made themselves or ha have made for themselves. Um, tells you how much memory is in there. Um, one thing that's handy uh, when you look at this menu is you can click here right away to get to software update in case you want to check and see if you have the latest um, system and what updates might be waiting for you. So we're going to do that right now. It's going to move up here. So I'm going to so and I'm going to go over again how I got here. So I'm going to the Apple icon up here. I'm going to about this Mac. And now I'm and we're on overview. Uh, see how there are different tabs along the top. And I'm going to click on software update. And I am connected to the internet. So um, it will go out there and connect to Apple. And it says, hey, your Mac is up to date. Um, if you trust Apple and you um, just want it to be taken care of without uh, you having to think about it, you can click this box and it will automatically do the updates for you. Um, my habit is to kind of wait a little bit and then I, uh, I do it myself. Okay, And I'm going to use the back arrow up here. So I'm going to go back again to the Apple icon about this Mac. And we're going to work, work our way across. So that's how you can, once again, find out um, you know, what um, model you have, what year it is. And it could be something I, I checked one of our older computers a while back, and I was able to see it was, a, I think, a, a 2013. It told me um, also um, that, that I couldn't update it any further. So sometimes you might want to do that just to see, um, find out what model you have and if it can take the latest um, updates. So I'm going to go to displays. Um, it's going to tell us what we have here. Um, I'm going to go to storage. And this could be interesting. Um, so it's going to tell you how much space you have on your internal hard drive. And I purposely left a, um, a USB stick in here so we could see that too. So this is the internal hard drive. And so it has 251 gigabytes of storage. It says flash storage. That means it's solid state, kind of like a chip. And it is, doesn't have the spinning platters. So they tend to be quick and um, they don't suffer from as uh, the mechanical breakdowns you would get with a spinning um, platter and, uh, and such. Um, it also gives you a breakdown of what's being used uh, for, in terms of storage. So just by, and this is another thing, sometimes you can just take the cursor and just let it hover over something and it'll give you more information or some kind of description. So here we know how much storage is being used for apps, um, hmm, other users, um, music creation, the system, and other. Um, and this is, uh, notice how the icons look different. So this is the one for the flash drive. And it's basically empty. Everything is, is available. Uh, or I think there's one file on it. Okay. Uh, I am now going to go to the next um, um, tab for support. And this can also be very handy. You can use this to um, get directly to Apple and get some information on and some tutorials. Um, so Mac resources, Mac support. So uh, I'm not going to go through it because it might take some time. We can do it at the end if you want, but you, it'll, it can take you to um, some um, like kind of sheets with information about your particular, particular model you have and as well as tutorials. And service, this is where you can find out about the coverage that it has. So now we're going to go to the system preferences. So now um, the Apple uh, icon and then system preferences. And this is where you can customize oh so many things um, about the operation of your Mac. Um, here, and you've, um, I'm not going to go into iCloud today, but effectively, basically, iCloud lets you um, store um, sundry information and settings in the cloud, which is basically just some, some um, computers elsewhere. So just not on your computer. And it can be, and when you do that, you can get at the same information from multiple devices. So some people have uh, iCloud set up and then as things happen, they'll get a, a ping on their phone or, or something that they've done on their um, laptop. So it's a good way for you to have your information backed up. You do, when it gets to a certain point, you have to pay 
if you have a lot of things stored, you have to give Apple um, more moolah as you go along. Um, but anyway, so I'm going to go, but anyway, that's, that's iCloud. And your iCloud sign-in should be the same as, um, and if you have a Mac or an iPhone or anything, you should have an Apple account somewhere where you gave them an email address and a password, and that lets you get in and, and um, buy things, control things, and that should be the same um, um, email address and password for iCloud. So I'm now going to go to general. Um, this is something I think it's fairly new for the Mac where they have different modes. So right now we're in the light mode. I'm now going to click on dark and we're going to see how it changes things. So notice how this now is a dark background, different level of contrast. Um, if you click on auto, then it'll make the decision for you depending on day and, and night and ambient lighting and things like that. I tend to like the brightness of the light one, so I keep it on that. Um, and then accent colors, you can play around with that on your computer um, to make it look how you like. Um, um, icon size, I don't think we need to go on that. This is an interesting one, scroll bars. Um, when you're in a, a window, so let me see, I'm gonna open up um, something. Let's see, Maybe. I'm gonna open up Safari. And notice there's no scroll bar there on the right side. Um, I'm going to move me down here. Um, let's see, I'm going to go to Google. Um, maybe I'm going to go to news. And there is a scroll bar there. And if you have a, a mouse that has a wheel in the middle, like here, you can just move that up and down to move that when you have it over it. Or you can use the pointer to grab it. So I put the pointer on there, put my finger down, and I'm dragging it up and down. Um, and depending on how this is set up, um, sometimes you'll see the scroll bar all the time. Sometimes it'll magically appear in context when there's a situation where, you, um, uh, where you, you're hovering over it, and then um, it, you could use the scroll bar then. I'm going to minimize this now and go back. Uh, yeah, so right now it's based on mouse or trackpad. Um, I'm going to change it to when scrolling, just to see how that makes if that makes a difference. Uh, yeah, so I see. A, so there's a scroll bar on the left side now, but I don't see one on the right side. But if I go over here, and I probably click. Oh, as soon as I started moving the uh, the uh, the wheel, then it appeared. Um, so that depends on I get your own personal preferences. If you want it to be hidden until you want it, or if you want it on all the time, I'm going to make it always just so I don't have to think about it. Um, this one is kind of important. Um, when you click in the scroll bar, you could have it just jump page by page. So if you're looking at say a, um, a website that's like, you know, five pages, uh, every time you click, it'll move one page at a time, or you can have it do this one where it jumps um, proportionately. Like, so if you have the, a line this large, it'll go to that spot. Like, it'll go to 75% if you're three quarters of the way down. Um, and uh, I don't know if you want me to demonstrate that or not. Let's see. I'm going to, I'm going to go jump, to, I'm going to leave it on jump to next page and go back to Safari, which is Apple's browser. And so I'm going to click here. I'm going to actually I'm going to drag it all the way up to the top. And see, I'm going to click once. So it's doing one page at a time. Now I'm going to go back to our control panels. Okay. And I'm going to go jump to the spot that's clicked. And go back here. And let's see how it behaves. So if I go down and I click here, hopefully it will take me down to the bottom of the page. And in this case, I don't think it really did that. I think it was going page by page. So, um, so I think that was a theoretical, but didn't actually happen in, um, in reality. Um, so default web browser, right over here. This can, this is fairly important. You may prefer to use Google uh, Chrome, or you may prefer to use Firefox or a Safari, which comes directly from Apple or some other browser. You can tell it 
you can pick that one. So these are the browsers that we have on uh, the computer. Um, I always have multiple browsers because some sometimes a website just won't work as well with one or the other. Uh, and so it's good to have some options or if, or if you know something just not working right that day or it needs to be updated. So in this case, I'm going to leave it on Google Chrome so that if I click, if I'm clicking on a link somewhere, it's automatically going to go to Google Chrome first. If I, um, by default, it's usually Safari on the Mac. So I, I must have changed that at some point. Um, and by the way, this is a new profile. Um, I just set it up uh, a day or two ago. Um, okay, I don't think the, I'm going to now move this if I can. Okay. So that's general. So we're not going to cover everything because we only have so much time and I only have so much knowledge. Um, but we're going to go back. I'm going to click on the, um, the grid. There we go. And desktop and screensaver. So this can make a big difference in your life, like how you want it to look. So right now we have um, this kind of pretty pattern that came directly from Apple. I'm going to click on desktop. So it's about how this background is going to look. And I'm going to click on colors. And I tend to do mine in, um, I try to make it less busy so I can see all the folders that are on the desktop. So in this case, I'm going to go and I'm going to pick ooh, this kind of aqua blue. It's a little bright, but, uh, or maybe I'll go with this one. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, we'll go with green today. Okay. So just by doing that, I now have a different background. Um, I can also, and I'm going to I'm going to close this for a minute. I'm going to go to the clean up now folder. And I'm going to look for Bugs Bunny. And I'm going to right click on that picture. So remember the right click using the right uh, side button or holding uh, control and clicking. And I am going to set desktop picture. And this is a time where one can panic and say, like, well, no, it's all out of whack and everything. So. In this case, I'm going to right click again and I'm going to do change desktop background. And it takes me back to this menu that we were looking at and see how bugs is in there. And this setting is fill screen, but there are other choices. So I am going to make it center. And depending on how large the actual file is, this one I figure isn't that large because you can see how it's kind of broken up. It's kind of pixelated and jagged around the edges. So I'm going to go to center. And oh, okay. And I'm gonna move this out of the way. And that's bug giving us a, you know, a little kind of a, uh, giving us, what is it, R razzing us. Um, and I can also change the background color. So in this case, I'm gonna click, while, while it's in this mode, I can click on there and you have a, a, a choice of different, I'll bring it over here, different ways to pick the color that will be the background behind bugs. And I'm going to try and see if I can find something that'll work with, I think I'm going to go for a shade of gray. So I'll go with uh, aluminum. Or I can go, I'm going to go with that one, nickel. Okay. So that is a way that you can change your desktop and um, both the whole thing as well as um, put a, a picture in the center around. I'm going to go back to system preferences. And here we go. So that was doc. Okay. okay. Oh, okay. So that was desktop and screensaver. I didn't get into screensaver much, but basically you can also just play around this when you want. But there are a lot of different beautiful images as well as um, uh, um, vocabulary uh, words hidden in the, um, um, uh, the screensavers. And the screensavers performed a very important function in the beginning of computers where with the old style of um, tubes and, um, and, and displays, they would get burn in if the same image was on the screen for a long period of time, it would kind of etch in there. And so the screensaver kind of helped with that. Um, it doesn't really apply to our current displays, but it's fun to have a screensaver. Um, and you can pick from a bunch here and you can also add them. You can um, decide how long until it takes effect. Um, so that's something you can play with on your own. And go back here. Okay, um, Brian. Yeah. yeah. Can you go over if uh, how you could use your own photo as like a screensaver uh, or like a desktop? Um, definitely on the desktop because that's what I basically did. Um, but um, so I'm going to go to clean up now, 
which is that following. And I'm going to go for here. So say this was a picture I happen to take of Tom Waits. This is his al an album cover that's here. So you can make believe it's a photo you took of a sunset or a family member. And I'm going to use the right click button. There are multiple ways to do this, but I'm doing it with the right click so I can get right to that menu. Um, the same one where we can make a folder or whatever, but I'm going to go down to set desktop picture. And if I minimize this, move this, it is now the picture. So that's one way we can also go at it from the control panel. Um, let's see, so I'm going to close that. I'm going to go up to system preferences, desktop and screensaver, going back to desktop. And we could then go and find it. I'm trying to remember how we did that before. Uh, Bugs Bunny, Center. Um, oh, so I, I offhand, I, uh, I don't see um, where to get to the, uh, the picture from there. So you can, you can hunt things down. Like right now, I'm going to the desktop, clean up now. So you can also hunt it down this way. And I'll pick a different picture. Um, here's just something, um, a screenshot of this is Canopy, which is a great service the library has. Um, and if you don't know about it, it's um, free movies to you that you can stream on just about any device, like a, a Roku, an Apple TV, um, uh, or a laptop or a phone or a tablet. Um, so anyway, that, that, so this screenshot, I believe, so I opened it, okay. So it didn't, didn't set it, did it? Let me see, no, so. I think the right click is the easiest way to do it, and that's how I tend to do it. But if we're under desktop, photos, oh, I'm going to go to, yeah. So I, um, I'm going to say for now um, that the best way is to right click and pick it from there. There's, a, there's other ways to get at it also. But one thing that does happen, once you have it, um, the, the photo set, um, you want to go to this menu to be able to change it if you want to enlarge it. Like right now I have it set as center. We could make it um, fit to screen, which will change. Then it'll make it go um, all the way top and bottom, but it might not work well for some images. Like this one doesn't have really the resolution to do that. Okay. So I'm going to go back to center. I also show you tile just for sport. Then it just puts multiple copies of it all across. So it might be entertaining, but it also could give you a, a fit. Um, you know, um, it's just very, very busy, and you may not be able to find your files. Um, yeah, once again, I tend to like a, a relatively simple desktop so I can find things. So I'm going to go to center, and we're back to that. Okay. So I hope that was um, clear enough. So I'm going to go to dock and menu bar. This one I think can be pretty handy. So the dock is the area down here. Can everybody see that? Where you have all um, the programs that you might be using, uh, applications and things. So you can grab the slider bar and make it large. That's interesting that's not doing it. Give me one second to figure out what's not going on. So for some reason, it's not um, responding. Let me check it again. So dock and menu bar. And if I, OK, there we go. So I guess I was at max. That's why um, it, it was user error on my part. So you can see how it's teeny tiny there. And you can grab the slider and get it to a size that works for you. So I, I was already maxed out. Um, and you can choose to have it on the left side, um, the right side, or the bottom. I think most people tend to do the bottom. Um, the genie effect is kind of handy. Let me see, animate. Oh, um, here's something that I do all the time with mine is I automatically hide and show the dock. So I'm gonna click on that and then it goes away. So you have more screen um, available to you. And if you ever wanna see it again, you just bring the cursor down and rest it for a second, and then it pops up. 
So that can be kind of handy. It makes your desktop less busy and you have more room with which to work. Um, and let me see about, okay, so I'm gonna now, but for our, dem our purposes right now, I'm going to have it stay there and the genie effect should be working. So I'm not really sure, uh, magnification. Oh, there we go. So uh, I had to check the box first for magnification. And then when you rest the cursor on top of it, you'll see it very large. And that can help you. And also notice you're seeing the text. So I'm going to leave it on that. I'm going to leave large maximums, large magnification, leave it on the bottom. I'm going to have the genie effect so that it pops up like a genie out of a lamp. And I'm going to turn off the, I'm going to turn on automatically hide because I don't want to, because now we'll have a little bit more um, screen real estate with which to work. And now I'm going to click back over here. Um, mission control, uh, I don't think we need to go limited time, I don't we go that, but that's, you can set up a little hotspot so that every time you put the cursor over here, it'll, it'll do something for you, like make it go to sleep or something. Um, I'll save that for another day. Um, Siri, I think you probably all know about Siri. So it's kind of like also like Amazon has Alexa, whatever, but you can turn it on. Um, it'll ask you to say uh, a few things so it gets to know your voice. And then you can go, hey, Siri, you know, what time is it? Hey, Siri, what's the, you know, tell me a joke or things like that. So you can have that and it's on your, uh, pretty much, I guess all your Apple devices um, have it as an option. Okay, spotlight, I don't think we need to go much on that. Um, language and region. <clears throat> this came up the other day, we we're helping someone, but if you use um, um, multiple languages, you can add them in here and then they'll be available to you um, in different applications. And also as menus across the, uh, the system. Uh, notifications. Um, this is something uh, you may notice some, um, some per sometimes you get an annoying pop-up um, when you're doing something uh, like maybe this, and then all of a sudden I might get a, a notice from um, some, some program. So you can tell it to, you can have a do not disturb. A lot of people do that for nighttime and you can go individually and turn things off. So here I'm on books. So I'm gonna say allow notifications. I'm gonna go, no, I don't want books to alert me when things are coming up. Calendar, I might wanna leave on. Uh, FaceTime, I'm not expecting anyone calling me, so I'm gonna turn that off. But you can go individually. Uh, unfortunately, you have to do it individually, near as I know, and you can turn um, things off so that they don't just pop up and give you a message, like an advertisement or, or even something helpful. Um, internet accounts. Um, say you, you um, uh, you have Gmail and Yahoo and something else like that, you can use this built-in application to connect to those um, accounts. And then you can see all your accounts in one place. You can look at them selectively, or you can um, see all your mail in one place. Um, it works very well. Um, I tend to use the individual app. So if I was using um, like Gmail from Google, I would actually, um, I would probably log in well, I guess on, a, on, on the Mac, not on a, I'm sorry, I was thinking about a device. I would, I would probably log in from the, uh, from the website. And so and I think Michael tends to do that too. How about when you're on a PC, Michael, do you tend to go individually? Well, I do. Yeah. So, but many people find this convenient because you can put um, multiple accounts from different um, providers into, in one. So that's what the internet accounts one is. Um, Walt and Apple Pay, you can add, you know, uh, your accounts to that and, um, and it'd be part of Apple's, <laughs> uh, I guess, um, uh, economy. Um, and it can, it can make it easy for you to pay for, pay for things, particularly on, on the phone. Um, I don't have anything myself set up in that. Well, and certainly not on this um, device. Um, Touch ID. Um, we did not set that up on this, but this is a way that you could tell it to know you by your fingerprint and you would do it a few times and then you would just do that to be able to log in. Um, so, and you've seen that probably on phones like the older iPhones, uh, less expensive models, they still have a little um, circle for you to do that. And um, on some of the newer phones, they're doing like a face recognition. Um, but you can also do that 
with um, with this touchpad on the, the touchpad down here. You could train it to um, respond to that. Okay. Um, users and groups. This it, it can be very uh, handy. So. If you look along the left side here, you can see we've created multiple accounts for us here at work so that we can um, do different things, have different permissions and say, I can log in on one and Michael could log in on another. Um, and we created one just for this class, which I mentioned, and that one we called Zoomy. And uh, so um, if you have multiple people in your, in your household, you may want to have set up um, individual um, um, groups, individual accounts, so that you can keep your information private. And, uh, and also, you should make sure if it's your computer that you have an administrative profile. So this one, we made it an admin profile so that we could do whatever we needed to do today, whatever changes. But if you have a family member and you're not too sure that you, uh, you trust them or someone's visiting, you would probably want to do a standard. You see that one when I rest on that? So, um, a standard account, which lets them you do everything, but they can't make um, changes to your system preferences and things like that. And if you have, um, and I always have this turned on on my computers, on my Macs, is guest user. And you just have to, and that's something you don't even have to configure. You just tell the Mac to turn it on, and then you will have an account that will always erase at the end. So if you have someone that you, once again, you know, you're not, you're not, you're not you don't trust them all that much with uh, using your computer. It'd be great just to put them on guest user. And then when you restart, when you log out of that account, everything gets erased. Um, the way you would administer this is you would click on this padlock. See how it says, click the lock to make changes. Um, you would have to use a username. Um, see, um, so in this case, it's the one for this account, and I would put in the password. I'm not going to go through this right now, but that's what you would do. So once again, make sure that you create for yourself a, an administrative uh, account uh, and that you know your password and that you write it down and keep it somewhere safe in case you forget it so that you can always be in control of your account and that you could delete accounts um, as people, um, you know, as needed. Uh, accessibility. Um, accessibility, there's tons of things. The Mac is very strong on um, adaptive needs. And um, I'm not going to go too much into it other than I showed you um, if we go to, was it, um, was it display? Contract. Okay, under display, and then go over to cursor. That's where you can adjust this. Right? See how, and that I think it becomes unusable at that size, but I'm going to leave it there. So that's how you can do that. You can tell it, the, the Mac to be able to speak, um, you know, menus to you. You can have it speak um, text within um, documents, um, depending on how you set this up. Okay. Um, so that's accessibility. Screen time, it keeps track of how much you're using the computer. Um, um, could be handy to know that. Discipline yourself extensions, things that get added um, to help your computer um, do things. Sometimes they get added and there are things that harm your computer. So it's good to take a look and make sure you don't have something um, um, offending in there. Um, security and privacy. Uh, um, I'm trying to give this something worth getting into. Um, so in this case, um, it, if it goes to sleep after, so was it required password? After five minutes, um, it, I'll have to log back in. I'll have to put the password back in. And you can choose how long you want to wait before it um, logs out. And in this case, I'd have to put the password in because I'm making a change, um, an important change to the system. So I'm just going to cancel out of that. Um, I'm not going to really get into firewalls or, or, the, or the file vaults. The file vault kind of encrypts all your data. Um, You'd have to be, um, you know, I think most people, you're not that concerned about it. Um, um, I'm going to go down here now to software update. So that's what we saw before. We just came at it a different way. And it's going to check for updates and see nothing's changed in the last, uh, you know, 40 minutes. So I'm going to click back over here. Network. This comes up often, right? Um, um, <clears throat> so right now, um, we're using the Wi-Fi. 
And I imagine many of you at home or when you're out, you're connecting to the internet wirelessly using Wi-Fi signals that get broadcast. Um, when you're here at any um, location of San Francisco Public Library, you should see this one, hashtag SF Library Wi-Fi. Um, so you would choose that um, and then it will, if all goes well, especially uh, it tends, our, our system I think tends to like uh, connecting to Max, it seems to work effectively. Um, you would have a pop-up screen, a permission page come up and you would click um, continue to the internet. I forget what the exact uh, phrasing on it is. And then you'll be using free Wi-Fi at the library. You've probably seen similar things if you ever go to Kaiser or UC Med or certain large um, company buildings, they'll have free Wi-Fi. And you usually have to click on some splash page and say you accept the terms. You don't need to use a password to get into the library's Wi-Fi. And you can tell if you need a password by that. See how there's padlocks? So these are ones that are all locked and you would need a password to gain um, entry. And you can also see along here on the right side about how weak or strong the signal is for your device in your location. Um, and also don't, you know, generally don't connect to a, um, a network uh, which is unknown to you. Okay, I'm gonna go back there. Um, I'm gonna, actually, I'm going to take one more look at Wi-Fi again, at network, Wi-Fi off. Okay, and um, by default, up here, you'll see um, in the menu bar, and also just like the dock, so I'm going to go down to the dock again. You know how it, you can hide it and, and go, you can do the same thing with the menu bar up here. But I think when you do that, people often get confused and frustrated and say, well, how come I can't see it? So, but you can make that hide and, and, uh, and then reappear. But anyway, so I'm gonna click on here and that's a quick way to get to Wi-Fi, turn it on or off and also look for networks. Okay. Now, okay, Bluetooth. So many of you probably have used or seen Bluetooth devices. Very often people have headphones, earpieces, um, uh, mice, wireless mice, and they basically use this Bluetooth communications protocol. And this is where you can turn it on, turn it off, look for devices and, and connect them. Um, the, um, very often the Apple, uh, um, the, like the Mac, uh, I guess desktops come with a kind of smaller version of this keyboard that's, and that's usually a wireless one that you connect via Bluetooth. Sound, oh, this is, uh, so you can customize all sorts um, of, of, of different alerts. Um, one of the key things here is, I'm gonna go to output, um, output volume and show it volume in the menu bar. So if I uncheck that, you, we won't see the, um, the, the, the sound is up here as a control panel. So I'm hoping that now if I go back in system preferences and then go to the sound and I click on show volume in menu bar, there it is. So if I click on it, um, we have lots of um, um, audio options. This looks a little different than um, the previous version of it. So um, output, you can change the volume by sliding it here. Uh, on most keyboards, there'll be a, um, an icon, so I don't know if you can see, they bring up close, but on the top row, let me see, there is usually three volume uh, um, buttons, and one will instantly mute it, another will lower it, another one will raise the volume. And from the keyboard, that's usually, I find the easiest way. Uh, the newer Mac, like this MacBook Pro, they have an LCD screen along the top, and then you have to touch the screen and then slide it. Um, you know, apparently it's, you know, it's cool and whiz bangy. I find it a little annoying because it takes me a little bit longer to do it. I'd rather just tap a button. Um, and of course you can connect, uh, the, the uh, MacBooks still have an output volume, um, like the little like headphone jack that you can plug in headphones or plug in external speakers. And of course you can also add Bluetooth speakers and have, um, or, um, or some other protocols of speakers to have, um, wi have wireless sound. 
Okay. What else we got along here? Sound printers and scanners. So this is if you got a new um, you know, printer or scanner, um, you know, whatever HP, Canon, different brands, Epson. Um, this is where you would go to um, install the software um, to um, to make the device work with you. Um, sometimes you'll go directly to the 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 website of like HP or something like that to get to download a particular um, app to do that. But you can do it directly from here. Okay, keyboard. So let's see what we get. Um, text, shortcuts, input sources. I don't think there's anything much to go on about with the keyboard. Um, trackpad, there is definitely differences. Um, so here is when we were talking about the, and what's nice is see it has a, this little kind of mini video giving you a demonstration of how to do the two fingers. Um, if you, right now, um, it is, this is set to have um, if I use the two fingers, I get, um, I, it'll be a click. So if I go over here, I get that. If I turn it off, let's see, I don't think, and then I, so right now I've taken my two fingers and did it. Uh, it's not giving me that special menu. So I'm gonna turn that back on. Tap to click, I think there are different opinions on that. That means that you can just tap it and, and have it respond. And depending if you have any kind of shakiness or, or um, or any kind of dexterity issues, it can be, um, you can wind up in a different menu or a different place than you intend. So I tend to not have the tap to click on unless you're a very, I think, skilled and precise um, user of the touchpad. You can change the speed at which uh, it moves across, you can move across the screen. Um, it can be super slow, super fast, something in between seems to make sense. Um, and also the the feedback um, the uh, when you click on the pad, like um, if you want it to be very firm or light, and we have it set for, for medium. Uh, Apple has their own vision of, uh, I don't know how many years ago it started with, with a scroll direction being natural. So it's the opposite way that Windows machines work and the opposite way that old Macs used to work. So I always turn it off. And then I just feel like then things are moving in the direction um, that I'm expecting them to. But right out of the gate, um, you have to you have to turn that off if you feel similarly. And here they can is more information on other kind of gestures that you can do. Okay. Uh, see other things that are important. Trackpad. Um, same thing with the mouse. I'm using a mouse right now. Um, you can change um, uh, settings on it. And once again, if, and this is a, a, a standard mouse. If you have one of the sleek Apple mice, then you definitely have to. Um, uh, and it'll know that, and then you'll have to engage that right click if you want it to, to work. But you can also change the scroll speed on the mouse. So I'm going to make it fast. Oh, good. So that's for scrolling us for up and down. For tracking speed, let's see what happens. It's really fast, and let's see what's really slow. Yeah, see how that's now it's on the slow settings. That takes a lot of work to get across the screen. And if I'm going to do it right in the center, and that seems to be about Right. Okay. So now I'm going to go back to that. I'm going back to these. So sound printer, scanners, trackpad, mouse, um, displays. Uh, sidecar. I haven't used it yet, but it lets you um, use if you have a new newish Mac and a newish iPad. You can have a. You can use the iPad as a bonus screen, as an additional screen. So um, it seems pretty nifty um, if you have the equipment. Um, uh, I haven't done it myself. Uh, mouse, sidecar, battery. Um, shows you, um, you know, the, the uh, um, what your current status is right now. It's interesting. It's 16. I'm, I'm plugged in, but it's only showing 69%. So uh, battery. And you can here you can customize settings for um, when to turn like um, uh, when uh, kind of um, I guess conservation I think so you can tell the screen to go to sleep after a certain period of time put the hard drive to sleep things like that uh, battery date and time um, you should let Apple kind of pretty much do that for for you you can tell it you know go to time zone pick where you you are so right. Our location is San Francisco, date and time. Uh, and you can choose how it displays up here in the upper right. 
Um, but basically, it'll you know it'll connect to the internet and give you um, accurate time. Okay, uh, sharing. I think most folks should not delve into that um, too much unless you know what you're doing um, about um, uh, sh you know uh, sharing information. And um, so I, I would I would uh, I would leave that alone. Uh, let's see. Time machine sharing. Time machine is very important. Uh, I can speak from experience because I didn't back up my iMac at home, and um, and I had some corrupted files, and uh, and I'm I've yet to be able to access my photos on my iMac. So you should have a separate uh, external hard drive um, that's large enough to have all the information that would be on your your computer, and you would plug it in. And when you plug it in, it'll Time Machine will probably pop up and say, hey, do you want to use this as a Time Machine to back up your information? And the first time, it'll take a while, it'll because it's basically going to, it's going to copy all your information. And then when you plug it in periodically, it'll then just update. And then if anything ever goes awry, you can, um, you can restore from that backup. It's a pretty uh, snazzy system. People who are super careful have more than one backup hard drive and they rotate them and keep maybe one off site and things like that. I think those are the, the main things about um, going, just generally going through the control panels and knowing what they do and some things about organizing your computer. Um, also, um, let me see, um, when you're down here at the dock, the finder is over there on the left. When you click on that, it's a quick way for you to get to things. Um, AirDrop, we didn't mention AirDrop. Um, AirDrop is a way, um, you have to have Bluetooth on and you have to have AirDrop uh, um, on, but you can then share uh, files between two Mac devices. Could be an I or uh, Apple devices. So it could be an iPhone, an iPad, a laptop, um, a desktop, but it's an easy way for you to wirelessly transfer, particularly large files. Um, so it can be handy. It takes a little, it may take you a few tries before you get it connected, but um, that's what AirDrop is. And once again, it's on the phones as well. Um, so here you'd see the documents that you worked on recently. Here it shows you all the applications. Oh, here's something I didn't show you, I meant to. So in the applications folder, that's where all your programs are, all the applications. And say this one here, tune in. If I want to be able to get at it easily, I would put my finger down and then drag it over here to the dock. And then I would keep my finger on it until I find the spot wh where I want to place it. So in this case, I'm gonna put it right over here um, next to Chrome, because I like to use it often. And that way that program is there for you and all you do is one click. So you can do that with all these um, different applications. And for those of you who have never used it, tune in, you know, it's a commercial product, but it's a free version with, with ads, but you can listen to radio stations from around the world, including our local stations like, you know, KPFA or KPU or, um, K, um, you know, KLW, KQED. Um, and you can listen to them right from your device. Brian? Um, yeah. Uh, can you explain Time Machine again? Sure. So I'm going to go back up to System Preferences. <clears throat> And down here is Time Machine, click on it. And here it says, so it's basically um, uh, a system for creating a complete backup of your computer. So you would want to have a hard drive. I don't have one here, but say this looks kind of like a hard drive. You could get one from various stores, you know, um, um, there's different brands, but you would get one that was at least the size of your computer of your computer hard drive. So this one is 256 gigabytes. So I'd make sure I had one that was well above that. So I'd probably buy a one terabyte hard drive, say, and it would have a connector on the end. And when I plug it into the computer, um, Time Machine will probably pop up and then say, "Would you like to use this?" Um, device, you know, this hard drive um, um, in Time Machine to back up your, your uh, information. And then you would go, yes. And then you'll have to wait a while because the first time it does it, it, it will take a while, but then it's going to back up your entire system. 
And then you can, you can leave it plugged in or you can take it out and plug it in periodically, but it's a way for you to have a complete safe backup of your system. If something goes wrong, you accidentally delete something or the hard drive fails. And unfortunately that does happen. Um, and um, the other point I was talking about is that some people, if you're being super careful, you know, they have more than one backup, especially if it's like, if this is your business or something like you would, and you say you're a photographer, you would have more than one backup hard drive and you would plug them in and swap them periodically to make sure you had a current uh, safe version and maybe keep one at a family member's house or something like that. And so in the finder, going back to the finder. Um, so when, this is, um, uh, I think that's I'm trying to. This is where you can you can also once it so you can get to applications. Um, you can see what's on your desktop here. Very often things will automatically go if you're if you're writing a document, it'll go into the documents folder. So that's how you can easily get to it. Um, very often if you're downloading something from the web and you're looking, well, where did that file go? It's probably over here in downloads. So earlier today I I downloaded the um, PowerPoint and that's where it went. So just remember that's there because um, sometimes you can get stressed out trying to find something you've downloaded and that's a quick way to get to it. And also from here, if I wanted to eject this flash drive, I could do it here. I could also do it there. So I'm going to close this. And that's another thing I didn't mention about. So the flash drive is basically visiting. And when you're done with it and you want to say, put it somewhere safe, take it with you, like say you brought over, you know, someone brought it over some some photos and you copied it over from there like and i'll do that i'll, I'll show how to copy something okay. so on flashy i guess there is nothing on there so i am going to open up cleanup now i'm going to take this picture of bugs and i'm just going to drag it on and notice how when i bring it over there it kind of highlights around the the hard drive the flash drive so i let it go and now that file is on there. And when you're moving something, uh, copying something from a, a one device to another device, you really are um, you really are copying it. You're not moving it from one to the other. You're, you're you have a version here, and when you move it to another device, it's making a copy and it's going there. Um, so if I'm happy with it and I have something on this drive, I can use the right click, and amongst my options up here is eject flashy. If I do that, then when it disappears, then I know it's safe to pull it out. So I have it attached. In this case, I have a USB port on the keyboard. So I'm gonna pop it out now. Now you always wanna do that. You don't wanna just drag uh, or uh, pull a flash drive out because you might have files open and you didn't realize it. And also the system wasn't expecting it. So the safe way to make sure you don't have corrupted files is to always do that. You you um, right click or some other, but you want to eject the drive and then wait for it to, to disappear and know that it's safe. Do you want me to also plug it in again just to show what that's like? I'm gonna do it anyway. So in this case, I'm, I have a port on the, on the keyboard. Generally, you would plug it into the side of, of uh, the computer if it has that kind of port and there it is. And if I wanted to, I can now drag bugs back and notice how it's still in both places. It's a, it's copied it. Now, let me see, keep both. Now, if I wanted to actually move it, like say, okay, I just wanted to deliver this file. I don't want it um, hogging space on my flash drive. If you hold the command key, which is at the bottom of your keyboard, if you keep your finger down on command and grab something, and then let it go, it'll actually move it. So notice it's no longer here. So there may be times when you don't wanna, once again, you don't wanna copy, you just wanna actually get it out of one place and into, a, into another device. That's how you do it. You hold the command key and then drag it. Okay. So Brian, can you go over uh, how to back up like photos from your Mac and how do you like, move photos from your iPhone to your Mac? With photos, like, so here's my, my Mac, which has all these uh, messages popping up on it. Um, so my, uh, my phone, you, you have multiple ways to store your photos. So in this case, I have them all on my phone. I don't have iCloud on it, but I think most of folks who aren't storing like 
tons and tons of photos. If you have iCloud set up, it's going to be saved for you in, in Apple's iCloud area. And then you can get at it by logging into um, another computer that's using the same iCloud account or another device. So that's one way of just having it stored by Apple and then it's there waiting for you. Um, you can plug in using a cable um, and Apple is, you know, so in this case, you know, this uses the Apple lightning cable and depending on what laptop or computer you have, you would plug it into connected devices and then it can do a backup either on the computer or you can open up photos, which is over here. I'm not going to be able to do it because I'm not synchronized with this one, but you click photos. See, I'm going to close that. And it can um, back up directly from your phone to uh, your photos folder. And that's what I tend to do. Um, and you can also just back up the whole device. Um, it'll actually ask you when you plug in, if you were to plug in your, um, your iPhone or your iPad to your um, desktop or laptop, it'll actually prompt you to, do you want to do a backup? And so there's a backup of, of, of kind of like um, general things. And then there's a backup that you can do directly to your photos. There's multiple ways of backup. I think most people, if they're not storing tons and tons of stuff, they're doing it in, uh, um, in iCloud. Uh, another option is using um, Google Photos. So if you're a Gmail user, you already have access to all these um, uh, Google products, and one of which is Google Photos, and it'll let you back up. Is it still unlimited, Michael? It's not anymore, actually. So it's only up to the amount they give you, which is, I think, 15 gigabytes mm -hmm. for all your products. Right. I think Apple is five gigabytes. And if you're someone who uses like a larger format camera, you could get to five gigabytes pretty quickly. You can use um, uh, Google Photos to back up and also then, um, and 15 gigabytes, it's a fair amount for most folks. Um, they do tend to sometimes um, compress your photos. So if you're a professional photographer, you would have, you'd probably be paying some service to back up your photos in full proper resolution with no compression or anything. Um, when you're using it with, um, with the Google Photos, depending, I think it, 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 uh, if, if a file is very large, it, it compresses it a bit. Most of us wouldn't notice it, but, um, but that's one way that's, that's free um, to be able to back up your photos from uh, pretty much any device um, using Google Photos. You can back up your entire phone onto a MacBook, depending on how much storage you have on your MacBook. Like this one is 256 gigabytes. Some phones, right, are 256 gigabytes. And depending if, if you filled it up with, with photos, um, you might run out of space on your um, laptop. But if you have a, like say, a, um, an iMac and it has one terabyte of storage, then you probably have more than enough to back up all your photos and everything from your phone. And then for that external drive, if you have it set on um, a time machine, it's going to back up everything that's on your computer, including whatever photos are in photos. So, Brian, how do you remove things from the dock? Oh, you just you just pull them straight up. So here, I'm going to remove FaceTime. So I'm I'm resting on it, right? And I put my finger down, and I'm just going to. Oh, let's see, you should just be able to drag it up. Let me see. Unless something's changed. There we go. Sometimes it's just how you finesse it, but you're basically taking it straight up for a few seconds and letting it go. And then that removes it from the dock. And then should I have the external hard drive connected to Mac all the time? I'm not sure what the wisest answer to that is, other than if you always have it connected to the hard, hard drive, if something happens, rather to the computer, say you have a um, a power surge or something, the hard drive could get um, damaged. So I would think backing up periodically would probably be the wisest um, thing. And once again, and some people just pay Apple to have everything up, um, all the key things in, in the cloud, but I think that can get expensive if you have a fair amount of files. I think you went over earlier about like browsers. So can uh -huh. you go over what are the benefits of having more than one browser if you, let's say, for example, you already have Safari installed on your Mac. It comes like as a, as a default, but what are right. the benefits of having like more than one browser? Okay. Well, the, the, the key thing is, I think most of it is that sometimes um, things just don't work. So um, uh, um, in fact, we just had one the other day, a small thing of where we were doing, um, I think a Google, um, uh, kind of like the Zoom, but it was on Google. I have my default um, browser as Firefox. 
and I couldn't change the the backgrounds on that. But when I used Chrome, I was able, it had that functionality built in. But there are sometimes just some web browsers just will have work a different way, have features that you like, or like I said, or um, sometimes you're dealing with a website that it just, um, a, one browser just won't work well with it. Say you're filling out a job application or something. So it's good to have um, different options. And some people just really like one browser more than the other for whatever reason. Um, Safari, it's built in, it's updated all the time by Apple. Um, they have that nice um, um, kind of reader mode where you can tell it to ignore pictures and, and ads and just kind of show you the text. But I think all the other ones have some version of it also. Um, uh, I think Google Chrome is the most popular and widely used, so it's probably more compatible with most things. Um, but I just, I just like to have multiple options. And I know uh, we've also tested out another browser called, was it Brave, Michael? Yes. Yeah. And we don't necessarily recommend it, but it's work, we've tested out and it works very well and it has some very nice security features in there about privacy. Is there anything that you want to say about browsers, Michael? So certain things might work well on certain browsers. I've gone to a website where it completely didn't work at all on a certain browser, but it worked fine on a different browser. So it really depends on your experience. And it's kind of like hit and miss. So like Brian said, if you have more than one browser, you could have like a backup. But if you have just one browser and you're fine with that, and that's just totally okay. But if a website doesn't work, you might have to get like another browser as well. And one thing we didn't mention is there's also incognito mode or private browsing mode. And do you want to describe a little bit about that, Michael? How yes. that works? And that's across platforms. You could have it on um, on, a, on a Mac or you can have it on a PC. So like if you have Firefox, I believe it's like private browsing or if it's uh, on a Chrome browser, it's like incognito mode. So what this does is if you open up like a website in that browser mode, then whatever you do in there, and you close it, it, everything gets deleted. So like if you're signed into like your email, you're signed into like your bank account and you're in like private mode or incognito mode and you close the browser, you automatically get signed out and all the history gets cleared off. But if you're in the regular mode and you forget to sign out, the next person to go or use your computer might have access to whatever you were logged into before. So that's one of like the positive features if you use private browsing or incognito mode, because you don't have to worry about logging out but you should remember to log out, but just in case if you don't forget, don't remember to log out. And for those of you who might be using like a public computer somewhere and you're logging in, say your Gmail account, um, you really have to go through several steps to properly log out, even if you're in incognito mode, I believe. So you have to make sure you, you actually sign out and then you see a page where it, you, it says like remove account and then you have to then still say uh, yes to it. It's like three steps. But if you're using a public computer, not yours at home, um, make sure you get all the way out. Um, people, they wouldn't necessarily be able to get into your account, but they could see your email address, but they, they can't see your password if you've logged out. But do that and then also make sure you close um, the browser entirely. And if you have an option of restarting the computer, that's even better. Would that be fair to say, Michael? Yes. Okay. Uh, someone asked about delete to trash. Y yeah, you should. Um, so when it's in the trash, it's still recoverable. So it's, um, it, it's in there and it's still taking up some space and you could still drag it back out onto the desktop and then, and then access it. So if it's something you're unsure of, you can just leave it hanging out there. But if you want to basically, you know, really get the stuff off your um, computer, then empty the trash. Where to go to find the airdrop option? So I found by use, so going down to the dock, and then going to the finder, then you find airdrop. And right now it says, allow me to be discoverable by no one. So I can make it people that are in my contacts that are in my device, or I can make it everyone. So if you run into a friend, uh, say at a, you know, a cafe, and they say, oh, you have, um, you know, you, you must have these photos I took of us together when we were camping or whatever. Um, this is how you could then just turn it on, tell it to be discoverable. They have to do the same thing on their phone. And then you can, um, you can then pick, pick a file, pick a photo, um, pick a video, and then you can send it. Um, let me, I'm not, I'm not going to be able to do the whole execution, but I'll show you like how you might do it from your computer to get, at least get started. So I'm going to go to the folder that has all the stuff in it. And I think I have a video in here somewhere. 
So if I right click on it, let me see. Get info. Share. Okay. Here we go. So I'm going to right click on the thing I want to share. Could be a folder, could be a document, and go to share. And then see, there's all different choices, one of which is AirDrop. And then it's kind of talking you through it. And say, okay, so on a Mac, ask them to go to AirDrop in the Finder. So, um, so if we had another device on right within, you know, proximity and Bluetooth was on, then we'd be able to send those files back and forth. Is that um, helpful? It's, it, my experience has been that sometimes it just takes a few tries for it to work, but when it works, it's pretty great. And you can send like, like um, sending, a, you can send a pretty large file that way. So Brian, there was a question about like going to history and deleting your browsing on public computers. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're doing the incognito mode or, or, or the um, private mode, um, you shouldn't have to do that. Um, but depending on your browser, right? So if we're in Safari. Oh, and, and I'll, hmm? I'd like to add that since um, our library computers, they have a special software where when you log out, everything gets wiped anyway. So you won't have to worry about that. But it's still wise to um, say just in case something, you know, we, we have it set up to do that, but you're, you're still better off making sure you clear things as well as you can beforehand. Don't you think, Michael? Yes. Yeah. So uh, like it should be a habit that you have, but all our computers are set to automatically wipe everything out. Um, so I was going to go to Safari. Was it under preferences? Um, it's, you know, it's in different places on every browser and also between, you know, your phone or your uh, tablet uh, or computer. So remove items. So here's something you can also, you can customize, you can tell it to automatically remove your, like, on your own computer. It can, it can clear your history, you know, that day. Um, and you can also, you can also tell it. So I, um, sorry, so I, uh, I'll tell you what, so I went to Safari preferences. And so here you can customize, like I said, if you just want to make sure your, your history is cleared after every day, you can set it there. You can also tell if you don't want downloads, if you don't want your files to go into downloads, you can pick a different location. Uh, I tend to make mine a desktop just so it's always there for me to see. Um, and under Safari, you go to clear, under, under Safari menu, you go to clear history. And then um, it's important to take a second and not just click on it because you have options. You want to just clear the last hour or do you want to clear all history? And so if you do clear all history and then click that, then it's going to get rid of everything from, from the whenever it's, you've started using it. And there's similar things on Chrome and on uh, Firefox.